Welcome and thank you for joining us on Birth Mother Matters in Adoption with Kelly Rourke Scary and me, Ron Rains, where we delve into the issues of adoption from every angle of the adoption triad. Do what's best for your kid and for yourself because if you can't take care of yourself, you're definitely not going to be able to take care of that kid and that's not fair. And I know that my daughter will be well taken care of with them. Don't have an abortion. Give this child a chance. All I could think about was needing to save my son. My name is Kelly Rourke Scary. I am the executive director, president, and co-founder of Building Arizona Families Adoption Agency, the Donna K. Evans Foundation, and creator of the You Before Me campaign. I have a bachelor's degree in family studies and human development and a master's degree in education with an emphasis in school counseling. I was adopted at the age of three days, born to a teen birth mother, raised in a closed adoption and reunited with my birth mother in 2007. I have worked in the adoption field for over 15 years. And I'm Ron Rains. I've worked in radio since 1999. I was the co-host of two successful morning shows in Prescott, Arizona. Now I work for my wife, who's an adoption attorney, and I'm able to combine these two great passions and share them on this podcast. A failed adoption match is when a birth mother has established herself with a prospective adoptive family and decides not to proceed with an adoption plan or with that prospective adoptive family. An adoption disruption is the interruption of an adoption prior to finalization. It's also called a failed adoption or a failed placement. And an adoption dissolution is the interruption or failure of an adoption after the finalization. During this podcast, uh, we're going to be talking about failed adoption matches, and adoption disruptions, because we are solely going to be focusing on newborn domestic adoptions. We're not talking about older children adoptions during this podcast. We're not talking about um, international adoptions. We are solely focusing on newborn adoptions. And when adoptions fail, we consider that the ugly side of adoption. Nobody wants to hear about the dark side of adoption when they're looking to plan their family and traditional methods are not an option. They want to know, you know, do adoptions fail? How often? Why? Who's to blame? What happens to the adopted family financially? What happens to the birth mother? What role does the agency take? Who can be held accountable? Did somebody do something wrong along the way? There's all these questions and concerns on behalf of the adoptive family. This is really hard. And I really want to take these two podcasts and try to break down and explain and establish an education amongst our listeners as to what happens and why and reactions that are elicited when these adoptions go dark. When somebody is experiencing the death of a loved one or some horrific event in their life, and you are a loved one to that person who's going through grief or a friend, family member, you always want to say, you know, I I don't have the right words or, you know, words can't erase the pain that you're going through. And just like that there there are no words that are going to bring comfort to somebody experiencing when an adoption match fails or when an adoption disrupts there's nothing that can be said to a family that is going to make it better that's going to erase the pain that's going to take away the hurt that's going to put the money back into their bank there's nothing that's going to be said that's going to make it better An analogy for a family that has vested their time, their emotions, their finances into an adoption plan or journey is very much comparable to a death because it is an indescribable loss. The first thing that can be done is to acknowledge that, is to acknowledge that it is a loss. It's a death of a dream. It's something that you are going to go through the stages of grief. And, you know, as an agency, we are all vested in the process of adoption. We want adoptions to be successful. When a couple decides that, you know, fertility treatments are the route that they want to go to plan their family because biologically 
they're not able to create their family the way that they wanted to. And so they need additional assistance through uh, infertility treatments. And if those infertility treatments don't work, it is very disheartening, very difficult, very sad. Again, they've invested, you know, time, emotions, finances. And I think that when you are looking at infertility treatments versus an adoption plan, in some ways, an adoptive family or prospective adoptive family can look at it and say, okay, so, you know, the infertility doctor did everything he could to help me become pregnant. And my body didn't take it. It didn't work. You know, he did his part and, and therefore there's nothing more he could have done. It was, you know, my body that didn't cooperate with the treatments. And when they're going through an adoption plan, because there's a loss of control. In other words, they can't see what's happening behind the scenes. And it, it may very much feel like, you know, the Wizard of Oz behind the red curtain that there becomes, you know, the blame game and the questioning and, you know, well, what went wrong. And there was no, you know, it wasn't my body that, that kept me from becoming a mother, it is the birth mother and the agency that was working with the birth mother. And so there, there comes this anger and this frustration. And a lot of it is because of the lack of control that is felt over an adoption situation. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. And it also brings with it more of an ability to blame somebody else, because that's how you kind of find a reason, you know, like, oh, it was the agency's fault. Oh, I, I know it was the agency's fault. And so it makes it so much easier in this circumstance to place blame, whether it's warranted or not. And most likely it's not. Right. A good way of looking at it is when an adoptive family, when we have to call them and tell them that, you know, either the birth mother has changed her mind or she has decided not to proceed with the adoption plan or she has decided that this isn't the right family for her baby. It is incredibly hard on, on the adoptive family side. It, it's horrific. It, it is also very hard on the birth mother, I'm sorry, on the adoptive case manager side. You know, I have one uh, adoptive parent case manager that, that has said that she will have to uh, pace around the room for a while before she can make the call because she knows how much that call is going to hurt and nobody wants to bring pain to somebody else. You know, social workers are in the helping field because we want to make things better. We want to help other people and we don't want to deliver bad news. And knowing that the adoptive family is going to be in so much emotional pain when you have to deliver this is really, really hard. You know, I have some caseworkers that when they have to deliver the news, they, they have to take the rest of the day off because they just have to regather their thoughts and kind of recompose themselves and, you know, get back on the horse. You know, they say, when you fall off a horse, the best thing you can do is to get right back on. And, and they can't even get right back on. They've got to recenter themselves and, and find their grounding again, because it is so difficult. And when the family goes through the stages of grief and, and they're in the anger stage and they're calling up and they're saying, you know, they want, and you know, they want their, their finances returned and they want to understand why they still have to pay for a failed match. It, in so many instances, it's hard as an agency to hear that because, you know, if this was an infertility doctor, you know, would you be banging on the door of the infertility practice and saying, Hey, the treatments didn't work. You know, I want a refund. Like that's not, so we're going to talk about all of this today in, in these podcasts, because I think it's really important for adoptive families that have experienced an adoption disruption or a failed adoption match, or maybe are entering into the idea of an adoption journey to really understand what this looks like because adoptions don't always work. That this is not something that is, you know, 100% going to happen. And just like when you, when you go to an infertility doctor, they tell you there are no guarantees. You know, when you are pregnant yourself with a baby, there's no guarantee at the end of the nine months that you're going to have a healthy baby. 
there's no guarantees that the baby is going to make it through the nine months. Mm -hmm. And I think as with life, there are no guarantees. When we have families that are deciding between infertility treatments and adoption, and they have not gone, you know, either route prior, what I, what I do suggest is, you know, really look at what is the best fit for you. Statistically speaking, depending on the type of, of infertility treatments, some infertility treatments have a success rate of about 23 to 24%. Again, it depends on what the circumstances are and, you know, medically where you are in the spectrum of what services you need. And so some would be higher, some may be lower. Adoption, the national adoption rate, they say is about 50%. Now, our adoption agency, I would say we run between, uh, this year we've been running between 78 to 83% success. That's so, impressive. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a, a big difference. Mm -hmm. Now, I will also say that with adoption, you don't have control over the situation. But with infertility treatments, there's very little control as well. You know, I mean, obviously, if you put on, you can go on bed rest sometimes, and there's things you can do to improve your chances. Mm -hmm. But it's the same with uh, an adoption plan. You very much can do things to improve your chances. You know, you can have contact with a birth mother. You can come out and and meet her and develop a relationship. You can send her handwritten letters. And there's certain things you can do to, again to improve your chances, but that doesn't mean that it's a foolproof situation. Like there's nothing that that can go wrong. So when a failed adoption match occurs or a disruption, as we just stated, the family grows through stages of grief. We structure our adoption contract the way that it is, and fees are paid on behalf of the agency to outside sources. You know, there are such things as, you know, legal fees, and we have to pay process servers, and we have to pay for motions to be filed with the court. Uh, we have to pay for the case managers for their job and what they're doing. We have to pay for things like birth mother expenses up until the time that she is no longer working with us. We have to pay for agency overhead. We have to pay for agency insurance. We have to pay for things like her transportation. It, there's so many aspects in the financial realm that are paid out, which is why that we don't deviate from our contract. Oftentimes, adoptive families when they're going through the stages of grief, really question the financial aspect. And they also question as to what happened to make the birth mother change her mind about an adoption plan. And this is what I call an adoptive family engaging in the hunting and gathering mentality. So the hunting and gathering is usually referred to as in the pioneer days, you know, the men would go out and, and do the hunting and the gathering and the women would stay home and they would nurture the children. Right. An angry, upset, hurt, adoptive family will often engage in this hunting and gathering mentality. And when they're hunting, they're wondering, you know, who's at fault? Did they not uh, engage with the birth mother or not? Did they not come out and meet her when they should have? Did the adoptive or the birth mother case manager, was she not diligent enough? Did she not follow through enough with the birth mother? Was there not a relationship there? Was the birth mother scamming? Was she not vetted enough at the intake? There's so many questions that they have. They want to know ultimately who's at fault. Who can they blame? And then they start playing the blame game. The agency, the birth mother, the birth father. Was it, you know, who was it? And they're, they're, they're wanting to point the finger. And then they reach the gathering stage. And that's where they're wanting all the information. They want the birth mother's medical record. They want record of interactions. They want, you know, they're checking the social media sites and they're looking to see, okay, they're doing the, they become, you know, private investigators and they're now researching and they're trying to find answers. And that part I, I get because when something happens to you and it's outside of your control, I can very much say I'm a person, person that really, really likes closure. I like answers. And then when I have answers, I can often find peace. When I can't have closure, I can't find peace in something. So an example would be when I lost my own birth mother when she was 59. 
And she had gone into the hospital with what we thought was a really bad cold and never left. I couldn't find peace in that. And so, you know, I myself had called and I got, you know, copies of her hospital records. And I mean, they were a foot thick and, you know, going through that, I'm not a medical person. I don't have medical training. I've learned a lot by reading them. (laughs) Um, That being said, I will tell you that it it didn't bring me closure and I didn't find peace. Right. That didn't, that didn't work. Well, what it kind of reminds me of or makes me think of is why people have conspiracy theories because they are trying to make make sense of something to them that does not make sense. And of course you go to JFK and people are like, oh, it was, you know, the CIA and this. It's a way of trying to get that control over something that, how could this one man, you know, kill the president, the most powerful person in the world, and just try and make sense of it. And that's kind of what we all do to some degree when something bad happens. Like you say, we'll go on the internet, we'll try and figure out why it went wrong. And uh, so I understand completely what you're saying. Yeah. And again, at the end of it, you really don't have that much more understanding. It doesn't help, unfortunately. It It doesn't. And when we have you know, a birth mother that changes her mind and I have the opportunity to speak with her. I will often ask her for her reasoning so that I can share it with the adoptive family because when there is an answer, it is much easier on the adoptive family. Like in other words, if a mother says, I didn't want a parent, I didn't plan on seeing the baby. The nurse brought me the baby and I held the baby and I realized I couldn't let her go, that I was going to parent. That's difficult and that's hard, but at least the family then knows why. And at least they can be upset and they can be hurt and they can be disappointed and they can even be angry, but they have a reason. When you have a mom that just disappears into the sunset, and you have no answers, and she ghosts, those are amongst the hardest for families to understand because they're waiting. It's like they're waiting and waiting and waiting, and they have no answers, and they don't know when to stop waiting, and they don't know, you know, why. And there's so many questions left unanswered. And I think, again, those are the hardest. It can be, you know, when a family member loses a loved one and it's because they've disappeared and they want those answers and they want, they, they want to put that to rest. They want to, to, to just find peace. It, it is, again, there's a parallel there and I'm not saying it's on the same level, but when you are able to have closure and you can have peace, that's how you can heal and you can move on. An adoptive family's response can sometimes be misguided by misgaging the agency's reaction. We still have to be professional. And oftentimes a case manager, you know, will be crying behind the scenes when an adoption does not go through. But when a physician is operating on a loved one and the loved one doesn't make it, The physician isn't on his knees sobbing with the family when he comes to deliver the news. And that's not to say that, you know, I haven't helped pick caseworkers up off the floor because they're so upset. I have. Um, I've had caseworkers that, you know, cried right along with the family that, again, very professional. But that doesn't mean that every time they have to call a family that they're going to have that same reaction. Mm -hmm. You know, some families, they may have developed a connection. I mean, not everybody develops the same connection. So they may have a family they developed a really strong bond with. Maybe they've already gone down this road before with a family. And again, going back to the one caseworker that has to pace the room for so long before she can make the phone call and kind of hype herself up to it because... Nobody wants to make that phone call. I've made it 
more times than I have cared to. And uh, it is amongst my least favorite things to do. It is absolutely indescribable. The memories of some of them will haunt me for the rest of my life. You know, they say that that there is almost a, a primal scream or cry that a mother will make at the loss. And being that person that has to deliver that news to somebody that elicits that response is haunting. It's absolutely haunting. And so not that I'm looking for adoptive families to empathize with a caseworker. I understand that this is our profession. This is what we've chosen to do. But I just want families to understand that we do get it. It is really, really hard. And our response is we are trying to be as professional as we can. And at the same time, a lot of our our case managers are adoptive moms. So they can relate. They understand. And the majority of our adoption staff are mothers. And so, again, they can relate as a mother, what, what that might feel like. Families will also say, you know, I, I really think that our situation is, is different and that we should, you know, you should really look at our situation to see if maybe we can get a refund, you know, because I want you to hear our story. You know, I get this frequently from adoptive families. I, I, I want to tell you our story. I want to, I want to tell you about why we should. And I have to say, I don't think asking an agency to show favoritism over one family is fair. You know, every adoptive family has a story. Mm-hmm. Every story is hard to hear. But saying that your story is more important or more valuable than somebody else's story to me is inequitable. Right. And the thing is, everybody feels that their own story is special because it is to them. In other words, if if you have two eight-year-old little boys, Mm -hmm. both of them break their arm and they both go to the hospital and the physician, there's only one physician and both mothers are crying, wanting their son to be seen first. And they're both trying to tell their story. How is it fair for somebody to listen to say, okay, well, your story is, is definitely more significant. So we'll take your son first. Like that just doesn't seem fair to me. That's right. Because the other, what's wrong with the other one? It's a tough situation. I I empathize with you. That is. And you know, some, I would say that any match or adoption disruption is really tough. Mm -hmm. The ones that families, in my opinion, have the hardest time finding peace with are when the birth mothers do disappear and we don't hear from them. And we, you know, either something pops up on a media, a social media feed or something and we hear later on that she had the baby and we don't have answers. I think those are hard. Not having answers, I think, is very difficult. In talking with birth mothers who have changed their mind and who have really struggled with their adoption choice, I have found, and again, this isn't statistical data, this isn't anything every mother is going to need to walk her own adoption journey. What I've learned is when a birth mother is planning on spending time with the baby in the hospital, what I have found to be the best and easiest in terms of attachment for the birth mother, if she really wants to spend time with the baby is to do it in short increments, do it in more, more times, but shorter periods of time, because the longer that she spends time with the baby, the more she's bonding and the more baby's bonding with her. And that makes the separation harder. Now, mm-hmm. some, birth, some birth mothers, especially mothers that have had children before will say, Oh no, I know exactly what you're talking about. I, this is the way I want it. And, and that's honored, but spending, you know, little bits of time frequently seems to be easier on birth mothers. And I have learned that from, like I said, from talking with, with mothers. And again, statistically, I'm not saying that there's any research backing that. I'm just saying from experience. That's what yeah, I see. This is just anecdotal um, evidence. Right. right. Uh, when an adoptive mom has a very close relationship with a birth mom, and then we find out that the birth mother has been scamming her and the agency, that's very difficult because it's a violation. 
In other words, it's not just her changing her mind, but it's, it's like when somebody, that feeling you get, like if somebody was to come in your house and steal things out of your house, like that violation, because you've opened your heart and not just, you know, emotionally, financially, et cetera, but you opened your heart to this person and you welcomed them in and you've developed that relationship. And when you find out that it was on false pretenses, that's another added layer that just hurts. When a family matches and the match disrupts very quickly after it has happened, that also is very hard because a family doesn't, can't wrap their brain around, you know, I wasn't given a chance. I wasn't given an opportunity to, you know, develop a relationship with this, this mom. I've seen that be very difficult. And this is where we'll pick it up next time on part two of this two-part series. We'll also have a special guest, Adam Scary, Kelly's husband, is going to be talking to us on part two of The Ugly Side of Adoption, Failed Adoption Matches, Disruptions, and Dissolutions. Thank you for joining us on Birth Mother Matters in Adoption. If you're listening and you're dealing with an unplanned pregnancy and want more information about adoption, Building Arizona Families is a local Arizona adoption agency and available 24-7 by phone or text at 623-695-4112. That's 623-695-4112. We can make an immediate appointment with you to get started on creating an Arizona adoption plan or just get you more information. You can also find out more information about Building Arizona families on their website at azpregnancyhelp.com. Thanks also go out to Grapes for allowing us to use their song, I Don't Know, as our theme song. Birth Mother Matters in Adoption was written and produced by Kelly Rourke Scary and edited by me. Please rate and review this podcast wherever you're listening to us. We'd really appreciate it. We also now have a website at birthmothermatterspodcast.com. Tune in next time on Birth Mother Matters in Adoption. For Kelly Rourke Scary, I'm Ron Raines.